and good evening, everyone. We'll just give it another minute or two while uh, the rest of the attendees start coming into the webinar now. Thank you once again for all of your time and uh, welcome to this webinar. So today we're going to be talking about clinical case studies, specifically using the MIO and in India. Just the agenda briefly. I will very briefly talk through what tools are actually available and techniques out there for yourselves in the retinal imaging and examination right now. Um, but then I'm aware, of course, the amount of webinars that are going on right now and the information overload in COVID. So we'll try and keep it light, engaging, and mostly we'll be hearing from our guest speaker, Dr. Rangaraj, uh, with more in-depth clinical analysis on what he's been doing out there right now in the field. And then, as I mentioned at the end, we'll have plenty of time, about 30 minutes for any questions that you might have. And as I mentioned before, please feel free to ask any questions by typing them in uh, with that question function in the bottom right of your screen throughout this uh, webinar. So just a brief bit on me. Um, so I've spent a number of years in digital healthcare and I feel that's why I'm very privileged really to be here with all of you as I've spent those years acting as somewhat a facilitator. I think one of the main issues with not just ophthalmology but medicine in general is when technology has tried to be forced on doctors um, when actually it's really about us trying to work with yourselves on this call to really understand the problems you're facing in the field and how we can overcome them. So that's really why I'm very excited to be here with you all um, and yeah look forward to supporting you on this journey. And so just a little bit of scene setting before I hand over to Dr. Rangaraj. I think historically speaking within ophthalmology there was an element where imaging and examination were somewhat exclusive. So for example, binocular indirects, you're able to do that full examination, but you weren't able to image. You'd have to go and get another machine, perhaps in another room to get that image of the retina that you might need for documentation, analysis, patient engagement, whatever it might be. But now, of course, we have this smartphone revolution. Uh, imaging techniques are becoming more and more common and far more accessible. Uh, so this service is becoming kind of expected across the market, which is great news for all of us. And I think the exciting part with this is once we're able to integrate both that imaging and examination in one device, we can start providing more support to the ophthalmologists in the field once you have that image uh, simply taken during the examination. And I think that's really exciting from my perspective, from Keyless perspective, because we can help to bridge that gap uh, to provide kind of secure, reliable, high resolution quality of care um, by leveraging some of these technologies out there. So for example, in the top left corner of your screen here, DIY solutions, as you're all aware, there are many, many different smartphone tools out there right now that you can use to image the back of the eye. These are really great. They provide that level of accessibility, but I think there's a number of elements there where Keeler can support on top of that to provide something that you can use in clinical care that's going to be reliable and secure. And so I think that's really where we come in, where we can help. What we're doing right now is effectively trying to simplify that ophthalmoscopy technique that we have so much expertise in to be able to automatically and simply extract those fundus images that information from the examinations you're doing with an indirect ophthalmoscopy technique, but using a smartphone embedded within that headset. Uh, this is great in many reasons because it saves time and reduces that need for multiple equipment while still keeping that hands-free, uh, wide field of view examination. Of course, this isn't stereoscopic, but in terms of providing that base level of care, um, it's provides ample um, the ample requirements that you will need in the field. And above all, I think it's highly affordable and enables support on the training front, which is really exciting for us to work out how we can further support you in the field. And so that's, that's all from me, really. Um, so I think I would love to introduce you all to Dr. Rangaraj now, who is on the call, and we'll talk through some of his clinical case studies that we've been supporting over the last few months uh, using this device, the MIO. So I'll start my lecture with this very simple introduction. Now, MIO Keeler is mobile indirect ophthalmoscopy. We have been doing uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy for a long time. 
and we have seen it evolve in the wards and we have even i have even used monocular indirect ophthalmoscopy the basic principle you just have a condensing lens and a kind of paraxial illumination not only you even the person standing next to you can see the fundus so we've been doing this in the ward rounds and things like that but that's not going to carry much weight today in the bare minimum you probably have a, a lens which is 20 diopter and maybe a small led light and you can see the image like uh, sam was saying yeah you can see the image and okay next you want to capture the image you go to step two you just put in an iphone you have a small led light and you have a camera which is basically paraaxial so when you have paraaxial uh, camera and a uh, led light you are able to see that very well <clears throat> you are able to see that very well so you should be able to record pictures which probably look like this so this is with a 20 diopter lens this is just with a plain jane um, uh, iphone and with the 20 diopter lens you can do this but the problem is that when you want to display this to your patient you're going to have all your personal pictures in these areas and i've deliberately put this picture here just to show that it will be quite embarrassing you've done a good job but it's not a professional presentation to your patient we do this every day the patient only sees you once or twice maybe and has such a procedure done on them and there is no way you can archive it search and secure storage so you lose your phone you lose your images now the problem is if you have an iphone or an android phone it's very difficult for you to search the image and you really don't know what that id of that particular picture was so here is where the mio comes in now you have a combination of headset and a mobile phone now what does this offer it gives you a disc and macular photography it gives you also the peripheral retina see the disc and macula you can use a fundus camera i do have a fundus camera but i find it difficult to look at the aura and maybe you know take a picture that becomes difficult and this is where this comes in and plays a role for me you can not only take the disc and macula photography you can also take the peripheral photography and you have a dedicated software app which gets updated so you not only benefit from uh, a professional approach you also have an updated version on your phone as long as that particular phone supports it <clears throat> it's very cost effective image capture system because and i also find the best part is when you have a headband and it is fixed on the headset your hands are free to do a spheral indentation and you can capture the image and you can process the image what i mean by process i will tell you in the couple of slides which i have to come so the hardware part of it is just the iphone and the headset and it has a small little magnet here now with this magnet you can put the phone either in landscape mode or you can one moment or or you can put it in the vertical mode which is the portrait mode i find this very easy because alignment is more easier because it's the natural uh, thing which you do it not kind of sideways and then we come to the software so there has to be something special in what you do and it has to be dedicated software so this is the main screen it allows you to put new patients you have a patient list and then of course you have the home screen then you have the review then you can search your patients you can search your patients and you can uh, set your login and your password and things like that with the settings now the new listing is in which you have the first name last name date of birth additionally some more fields are going to come in which the hospital id will also come so it helps you to identify the patient because we have similar sounding patients same name patients things like that even with the date of birth so if you have an id that makes it more easier so all this all this comes when you have that now when you start to examine the patient you go to the next screen so you have entered all the demographic details and you go to the start of exam so when you go to the start of exam it brings you to the next screen the next screen tells you which eye you're going to select and which condensing lens you're going to take now why this condensing lens i'll tell you that's where the unique function of all these uh, dedicated software app comes in now 
when you look at 15 diopter and 20 diopter you're going to get a little more magnification you use a 15 diopter if you want to see something more closely and it gives you a little more working distance then you have the 20 and 28 which gives you the normal field of view which we normally are used to in, in, in an indirect and you want a little wider field for example you have a neonate or you have somebody who is restless you can easily use these 30 diopter lens or 40 diopter lens substitute that you get a wild you get a wider field and you can also see the pathology and understand how the uh, actual pathology retinal pathology is apart from the posterior pole you can also see the uh, almost up to the equator when you have 69 you can swing it around and that's the advantage so it gives you a means to select this and accordingly capture the image and then you go once you have done that selection you go to the next and then you start to record the examination you have a familiar red button these are very intuitive in fact i don't even have a manual for this it's extremely intuitive and once you do that it starts to record and when it starts to record this is how it looks but this is not the image you're going to get what happens is once you finish the exam it starts to auto extract these images it's taking a little time now but sam has promised that it should be it will be faster so once it auto extracts this is how your image will look now this is an image which i have taken and inserted so that's why this clipping comes but these are all auto images you'll find that you get this blackened screen and it's extremely professional looking and this is how it will look and then you also have a means to annotate what you see say for example you want to show the optic disc it's there or you want to show a splinter hemorrhage you want to show some myelinated nerve fibers you want to show that there is npdr in this patient and you can explain this to the patient you can show them and this can be archived and then the next step is it synchronizes automatically into the cloud and the storage is automatic so you lose your phone you're not going to lose this all you need or if you have forgotten your phone one day all you need to do is to just log into another phone and you come back to your patients and your list so that's the advantage of this software so the software is designed to extract fundus image from an examination video what looks like this will look like this the image is saved for documentation post capture processing and manipulation when we say post capture processing there are many things we can do with a jpeg image today we can run many of the programs like an auto mosaic or we can do it manually and all these things are possible and like sam was saying this is a very exciting time to be in this field capture the image and manipulate it and then you also have wide field stitching of the images i will show you how that looks like and your data image data is so is stored in cloud securely and is available for transfer now that brings us to the question of how we are going to use it let me give you a simple example previously we were just uh, writing down everything and then we were saying okay this is what it is and then we drew a diagram and our artistic ability was only limited to our our artistic ab ability Th that is when you want to draw the fundus picture but when you have a photograph that is what it is and that is what you saw so i prefer to document all dilated fundus exam in my clinic so i have a permanent record of every patient who came in so if somebody if if this a b c patient came to me and then went to another patient and then called me back and said doc there was a hemorrhage which the other doctor found out i can say look i have the photograph here and you did not have it on that day so it is that clear so documentation is going to help us not only for us legally it also gives you a satisfaction to explain to the patient and share it with the patient and the mio is cost effective in all stages of your practice which means that you are a newbie who has just finished the fellowship and you have come out or you are five years into practice or a 10 year into practice this is the time banks will not give you loans and that's the time nobody will come and see you but sam promises that you are the guys they are going to see the reason is that you can capture the image which was not possible when we started there were only those expensive size cameras that too you had to process the film that was extremely difficult this is in an instant i get the images immediately 
and it is portable. So you become a little senior and people are calling you to multiple clinics. You, this is portable and you can go to all the all the clinics and consult and you have a record of the images you have seen and the diagnosis which you have made. And you also happen to work in a multi speciality hospital in an ICU settings. You want to do a bedside exam. You can't do a direct scopy. It's going to be difficult. You can't take your indirect and go inside lots of connections. This is very simple. You just put on the headband, stick your uh, you know, phone onto the magnet and then you go ahead and you can diagnose this uh, papilledema which is there or maybe if it is a traumatic optic neuropathy, they are usually comatose and the optic nerve believe me looks absolutely normal at the time of trauma. The, 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 the pale disc comes in in about six to eight months time but you have documented RAPD and you documented a normal disc to see and you are going to you know have a perfect examination which is going to be bedside. So basically in a comatose patient you are going to see if the pupil is going to react. Is there an RAPD or how the disc looks like. So these are the two things you are going to do. And then in of course a preeclampsic uh, toxemia for example. You have a, a gynecology patient who is fully pregnant. She can't even sit on the wheelchair and come to your clinic. So what you do is go examine and these are the changes you will find. You discuss with the gynecologist and obstetrician what it is and go ahead. You have a record and then they come back to you and find normal. I mean this is because of the transient increase in the uh, in, in, in actually BP. I mean in the and of course you have the nephropathies. Um, you know you, you have your nephrologist who wants to decide if it's a diabetic nephropathy or it's uh, hypertensive. So a picture will definitely go a long way in consolidating the diagnosis. I find it extremely easy to explain the eye condition to the patient. So in this picture I could tell them look you got a hemorrhage here, you got diabetic retinopathic changes and you can just show them oh this is just myelinated nerve fibers this is fine or like this particular patient he had a cataract. Now the problem was I could see it with an indirect ophthalmoscope which is really bright but I can't treat it with green laser at that point because it has to go through the cataract. So what do I do? This picture is on the second day post operative. Do the laser on the second day and this is the operculum this this particular shadow and this is where the hole is. You can see that very clearly. You can see the shadow here. This is the shadow of the operculum and this is where the tear is and this is a little bit of fluid. This, there was some more fluid here when you indent you can see that. And of course you will have this kind of a patient. They will usually be the last patient of the day. It will be about 637 when you want to go home and this is when it will come. And imagine you have to, to treat this horseshoe tear which is a HST and you know that you need to treat this patient and you know as a doctor that it's dangerous for this patient to be walking around with this kind of a tear. They have come with you with all the classical symptoms of flashes, floaters and everything. Maybe there's a little bit of bleed. This patient had a li little bit of bleed because there's a blood vessel here and you know small whiffs. He was saying I could see cobwebs with red in color and they will usually be the last patient. So here comes a situation where all your experience and expertise you want to explain to the patient that he can't really go out of the clinic before you treat. Now kingdom come you cannot really explain this. You will have to speak maybe 10,000 words but if you have a picture you show them this and you go ahead and do this and send them home. See there is satisfaction in the service you provided. You have not exerted yourself. You have professionally talked very little and you have done the job and sent the patient. The service quality is extremely satisfying at that point. And then of course you have a patient with a papillitis like this. Explain it to them. Look this is what it is. You need to start the steroids. You need to do this. You need to do that. So if you have a picture you don't really need to talk much about it. All you need to show is show them the picture. Show them the condition they have and it makes it very easy. So I find that this is an extremely cost effective image capture device at all stages of your practice. And then you have a patient who has undergone laser already. Uh, they have gone through uh, angiography. You have done one more check angiography in about three months time 
And what happens is that you find there are still some amount of capillary dropout zones and you want to treat it. So you tell the patient that I need to fill this, these up. So when you're doing a fill-in laser, finish the fill-in laser, show them the old scars and show them the new ones. So they know exactly what it is, hap what is happening. So you show them the angiography and you show them this is the two blood vessels between which I have done the treatment. So it's extremely satisfying to explain to the patient and more professional. And now comes the retinopathy of prematurity. I've been doing this for a long time. And screening of premature neonates is very important because ROP incidence is a surrogate for the quality of care in a neonatal unit. In fact, that hospital has done at least two DNB students who had their dissertations on this. And they did successfully pass. And one of them is a, uh, is a neurologist today. Image documentation helps in meticulous follow-up and surveillance until 40 weeks for at-risk babies. So we are going to see the at-risk babies and we are going to see babies who need even more close follow-up and you're taking a photograph each time and that really helps you to closely follow up. Now, if you didn't have a photograph, it's very difficult. You drew diagrams. Yeah, we have diagrams. We can say zone one, two, three, and you know, this many clock hours. It doesn't make sense when it comes to counseling the parents and they don't understand why they have to come and see you. It's good enough that they have to come and see the neonatologist every two weeks. They have to bring that small little baby weighing from maybe 600 grams to about maybe 1500 grams. They're extremely light. And it is very easy for you to explain the intervention when it is indicated. For example, you have a picture like this. You know exactly that this is the area you're following up. You have like a stage two, maybe not reached threshold, but you find small little blood vessels here. Then you know, okay, what it is, you can, you can explain to the patients. They understand you can stitch these images, get a wider field. And you can see these ischemic zones here. Again, ischemic zone in the other eye. So it makes it extremely easy to counsel the patient and intervene at the right time when it is indicated. So in summary, the, the mobile indirect ophthalmoscopy is a cost effective platform for image capture, cloud storage and archiving. And it's an excellent tool for peripheral retinal image capture in all age groups. Believe me, you want to capture the peripheral um, uh, retina. It's extremely expensive. Like uh, Sam was showing you that slide in which it becomes extremely expensive and you need special lenses. This is one way to actually image the periphery from neonates to adults. Thank you very much. And ophthalmoscopy has come a long way from 1920. And this is how they used ophthalmoscopy at the time. They had to reflect sunlight and this is the recost wheel. Of course, the handle is not working. And this is how it was in 1920. Thank you very much. I would like to answer the questions. There are any. Sure. So I think we've just started the question mode there. And I think firstly, though, thank you, Dr. Rangaraj. That was really fascinating from my end. Um, I mean, especially on that patient counseling front to get the buy-in, I find that a really interesting um, pathway, essentially, in terms of how you work with your patients in the clinics beyond just the medical legal issues. So it's really exciting to see. And it's been right. an absolute pleasure working with you on that um, to support that further. So we've got some um, questions here that we can start answering now. Yeah. Um, so in terms of what phones this works with, uh, right now, the application we have is made for iOS, so Apple phones um, from iPhone 6 and up. And we are working on developing an Android port for that in the next few months. Um, one thing to note on Android, of course, is there's a wider variety of phones. So you need to ensure that that illumination is coaxial to the camera. I think, Dr. Rangaraj, you've used an iPhone. I forget which exactly. Five. I, I used an iPhone 6 and iPhone 7 too. So there's a question there. Would you recommend this for student use? Yeah, I would, I would like to answer this question. See, I would recommend this for, uh, for, for people in training. But the, 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 the problem is that in most institutions, when you take images, 
there is certain legal legality in that you can't just take pictures like that the problem is that there may be some of these pictures which may go in for publication so uh, it depends upon each institution as to whether they allow it or not but as a student if you're in a government medical college you're seeing thousands of patients i'm sure it, it is definitely going to help us and uh, i wish i had a tool like this when i was uh, training so you have to just find out if it is legal to do that in your institution that's about it otherwise you can use it definitely we're more than happy to support um any teaching institutions on that to work out how we can best support that effectively and your teaching methods uh so in terms of the field of view dr rangraj you actually provided that breakdown of the condensing lenses so maybe you want to talk through that yeah uh, are you able to see my screen, Sam? So, so when we are talking of field of view, when you have 15 diopter lens, you're going to see about approximately 36 to 40 degrees of field of view each time. So you can tilt around and you get a little more magnification. But when you want to see a wider field, go to 30 diopter, 40 diopter condensing lens. These are available. And uh, it gives you a larger picture, especially this is useful in patients who are uh, restless and uh, neonates when you want to have a quick exam. And that's what you can do. And one advantage of the mobile indirect is your babies are not screaming as much as you would use uh, one of the red cams, which I've used, which is which makes most babies scream unless you are uh, giving them a little sedation, which is pretty difficult. You can use the 30 adapter or the 40 adapter, uh, get a little bit of uh, working distance. So you can actually see up to the periphery. So it depends upon how you manage. It's just like an indirect ophthalmoscope. So, you know, you can scleral indent, you can see the aura, you can see everything. So it's basically like you can see 360 degrees of the, of the retina. In fact, all those pictures are from my clinic. Excellent. So the next question, how this helps in RFP screening? Yes, I, I had dwelt on uh, some of those slides. Um, in fact, like I said, that that is probably one of the most important applications you can have uh, screening premature neonates. And uh, most of the neonatal units would want their ophthalmologist to do the screening because it is a surrogate for the quality of care in the neonatal unit. And uh, as we know, ROP is just not lack of oxygen. It's, it's a multifactorial uh, uh, disease process which we have in our hands. And uh, it is very easy to do the documentation. You can stitch the pictures. You, you have a good record of what you have seen uh, week on week or once in two weeks, depending on the follow up you have. Uh, I mean, depending on the condition the baby has and uh, you can follow that. And you can do the intervention as and when it is required. And you can tell the patients why you're doing the intervention and where you're doing the intervention. Uh, these are the manipulations which you do in the software. So you don't stitch it at that time. So I'm sure Sam should be able to, uh, I mean, tell us a little more because this software is uh, a little buggy probably. I mean, they are, they are trying to get it into the, uh, uh, the app. And once it comes into the app, we should be able to do that. This is like, when you use a fundus camera and you have the auto mosaic, so it automatically stitches because of the uh, landmarks which you have here. Exactly. And I'm happy to expand upon that. So right now we have that as a beta function. It's not in the application, but we are uh, working on that in the coming months to provide that as an automatic feature. So the images showed previously in the presentation were a beta where we have stitched together those images of the fundus. Um, there are some reflections in there which we can work to post-process and improve, which we are looking into. And so we're looking to build that as an automatic function for through the application. In fact, I would say that this is a device which you can use at all age groups, either adults or uh, you know neonates. The, the best part is, you know, you want to explain something to a patient and tell them the gravity of the situation. Now, if you are a, a consultant who's been in 20 years in practice, you, you have all these instruments in your clinic and you feel, I mean, I'm explaining, 
but the patient is not able to understand. Now imagine you're going for checking your glasses and you think that you need to change your glasses and then you end up with something like this. Yes, you did say that you have a floater and you had flashes, but the point is that if you show them, if it is a show and tell, you don't have to talk. You don't have to talk much. You can explain to the patient. You can show them similar pictures and counseling becomes very easy. And so the next yeah, question here is comparing yeah. to fundus cameras, instability yeah. and ease of use. I have I have seen quite a few of these pictures. That is uh, from Trinetra, then there is Remedio, and all of them. All of them, Remedio is also using an iPhone to do the capture. And uh, see, it's the post processing. Today, when I have a JPEG image, uh, all I need is a JPEG image. If I want to run AI on that. I can run it. But today, FDA is approving only what we can still see, like microaneurysms, small hemorrhages, exudates, and things like that. I'll be happy to show you a picture. This was processed on the Orbis platform. I, I, I had told Sam that I will not show that, but since somebody has asked me this question, I will go ahead and show this picture. So this is what it is. So the future is going to be in IA interpretation. Uh, especially when you're having a remote clinic. So you just run your JPEG images into this uh, customized software and then it tells you it picks up all the hemorrhages, the microaneurysms and gives you a straightforward saying whether it is you have this red thing here. It's not so clear, but it tells you whether retinopathy is there or not. So in your remote clinic, which is manned by somebody who is not so experienced, they can also pick this up and then further transmit the image to you. So the, the basics of anything which you want to do in future is your JPEG image. So once you have a JPEG image, then the possibilities are more and they just um, process the signal. It's as simple as that for Sam. I think that's why I, this is really exciting as well, I, that we can start to bridge that gap quite simply now. And once you have those images, being able to examine yeah. and get those yeah. images, yeah. 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 the support that we can provide yeah. to the workflow of ophthalmologists is extraordinary once you start applying techniques like that, which is very exciting. Uh, so the next question there is, is there a, a shield available? And yes, so there is. Um, similar to the Keeler binocular index, there is a face shield that goes on the brow bar over the device um, to cover the user's face and provide that barrier to transmission, which is especially important during these COVID times. Uh, how so would this, you rate the stability yeah. of the iPhone on the headband? Yeah, this is one of the things I, I also had um, uh, a question for Sam uh, on this, but I found that it's pretty stable. And uh, what I did was I put the metal between the cover and the phone. So it kind of is very discreet. And it and it uh, sticks very well. The, mag the the magnet is really good, unless you kind of hit it. I mean that kind of a system. I mean any any system would uh, you know drop it. Even if it was uh, uh, holding it with a caliper or something like that, you would still do that. But what happens is as you get used to it and you become comfortable with this uh, modality, then it makes it very easy. Everything is a little bit of use, and uh, once you do that, you're able to easily manage. It's pretty stable. It's pretty stable. Unless you really hit it with your hand. And so the follow on question, actually similar line of thinking is, do you have to change your technique um, when using the MIO compared to a normal binocular interactive thermoscope? No, absolutely not. I don't, I don't think I need to change that at all because uh, the alignment. In fact, I, I use the camera and I, I, I mean, I use the phone in the in the in the actual portrait mode, not in the landscape. So one moment I moment I switch to the, the portrait mode, the alignment is easy. I'm able to indent. I'm able to get a picture. And auto extraction really helps. And I've been telling Sam that give me a manual one with a foot switch. And I think they're thinking about that. Exactly. That's a lot of variations and improvements that we are looking into, um, ways that we can simplify this further. And that's one of the exciting things about working with yourself, but also anyone else on the call that we're looking to continue improving with this and work with you in the field. And just adding to you as well, I think 
there's a very occasionally people experience a very minimal bump in terms of the difference to a binocular indirect. I think right. you just need to get used to and do a few practice runs, maybe on a Model I, just to get used to looking at that screen as opposed to a binocular indirect. But the technique oh. is is very similar, so there's no major learning barriers there. And what I would suggest is whatever be your uh, uh, your uh, experience, I mean, whatever be your experience, use a Model I. I have a Model I all the time in my in my clinic. I use the Model I. I hone my techniques. So when I'm actually using it on a patient, it would look as if I have been using it all my life. So it makes things easy. And these small, uh, small little, I think it's called Reti I by Orolab. You can buy that. That's about a couple of hundred rupees or maybe 500 rupees or 600 rupees. There's a fake retina also. And, uh, you know, it's very good. And what happens is once you start using that and then you, you get your hand eye coordination along with the headset, it makes it very easy for you. So you don't need to fumble when there is a patient. And yes, you can save the patient data. See, for that one patient, you have different dates coming in. So you can have on a particular date what images you have taken, another date what images you have taken. So all these archivings are very important because you can pull these images out when you need it. So that's the advantage of follow up. So when I say follow up, it means that day one, day two, day three, along with the dates, you have all the images on that particular day. So that's the advantage. Uh, is it possible to print this now, Sam? So right now, so right the now application we have, you can send a password protected PDF, which you can print these images from uh, in a report. And we are looking into how best we can adapt that export function in the future. So if there are any particular requirements for your institution, then please let us know. And then of course you can get that raw image file too. And what would be ideal is if you have a wireless printer, you can just use AirPrint, which is there in iPhone. And you can just print it out as and when and provide that uh, report to the patient. Sam, when can I get this? Uh, so you can get this now. So we are in a position now where we can ship this product. Um, yeah, so right now. And we're excited to get that out to India. Yeah, the image quality depends on two factors. One is uh, it takes a little bit of time for you to get rid of the reflexes, which you're going to see because you, you're having an LED light, which is pretty bright. So I think in the future softwares, they're going to incorporate that we can decrease the lighting and increase the lighting, depending on whether you're seeing a small child or you're going to see an adult. Adults can tolerate a little more of uh, the LED illumination. LED illuminations are pretty bright. So they, you can do that. And once you start to get the hang of it, it's like the first time when you did the indirect optoscope, you were seeing only reflex. You never saw the retina. So the same thing happens. There is a small learning curve. It's like multifocals or maybe a reading glass or anything, as a matter of fact, has a little bit of learning curve. And believe me, you can reduce the, 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 the learning curve if you have a model I. So the model I definitely helps you in doing that. And I think it is best to use a model I and you can get this from oral lab and it's very cheap and it can be used. The image quality is good. And uh, in fact, the pictures which I showed you is from our actual pictures from the MIO. And as the phones get more sophisticated, we are going to get even better um, images because the sensors are going to be much better. So there is one part to this whole thing. As the phone gets more sophisticated, the apps can be easily upgraded to that. So the advantage is that you have your patients, you have your images, and you are kind of upgrading with it automatically. So the price what you pay for is because the upgrades are going to occur. And on that question, there is a question on price right there. Um, so the price right now in India, it depends somewhat on your region um, through your local representative. But it's in the region of 70,000 uh, rupees to 80,000. But please reach out to us um, after this or to your local representative and dealer, and we'll work out that exact price for your region.
And that includes the hardware, so the headset, as well as the software, the application. Yeah, I think I've answered this. Uh, this is from uh, Dr. Ravi Gowda. Uh, how do you rate? Uh, how do you rate with repeatability of the image with the same patient taken at different time? Um, it depends on how you take it. You have a well dilated uh, pupil, and uh, you know you are conversant with the machine. Then I think it should be very easy, and uh, you'll you'll get almost the same kind of an image. It it takes a little practice. Uh, you don't need an assistant when you are indenting because you are hands free. Um, basically, you, you, you put on the headset and your phone is there. Uh, I mean, your image capture device is there and your both the hands are free. So I find indenting not to be a problem. If you are adept at indirect ophthalmoscopy and uh, scalar indentation, it should work. You can use a cotton, but that's even more easier. Uh, baby will cooperate with the flash from the iPhone. Yeah, they will because I do use a LED indirect. Um, they tolerate it. And you're looking at the peripheral retina. Start with the periphery first and then come to the center. Usually they get adapted by the time. And uh, even this lighting, I, I think they're going to incorporate something in the software by which you can control the amount of lighting which is coming in. Exactly. I was exactly. about to say that. <laughs> uh, yeah, this cup disc uh, measurement uh, help us during follow up. Uh, this is a good question. See, um, let me put it this way. The concept of uh, cup disc ratio is now changing. We are now looking at uh, BMO. That is the, the Brooks membrane out versus the in uh, the ilm so the the definition itself is changing to recognize the amount of damage which is occurring on the optic disc this image should be good enough but is it good enough for for progression analysis that's difficult to say because you're going to see the the area which is thinnest and you're going to follow that up so yes it does help you to show that you have a cupping, yeah, there's a notch, there's a splinter rim. It will definitely tell you whether there's a splinter rim or not. And when there's a splinter rim, you know that progression is occurring. And you can also look at the nerve fiber loss. But it depends upon how well you're taking the image. So a certain amount of uh, alignment and expertise. And as you use that, like with indirect ophthalmoscopes, today we are able to see everything so clearly and deliver treatment at that precise spot same thing we should be able to do that but i don't think you uh, i would rely too much on the measurements even in a uh, high end fundus camera when it's giving me those uh, those ratios and all that i would just use that for follow up i would measure red free uh, you know uh, i would take the image and make it red free and then probably see the nerve fiber loss so those are processes which are coming out in the future so when you want to see the nerve fiber loss, that's what you do. It's not straight away the cup disc ratio and this tells me that it's gone. What you're doing is you're building your diagnosis and the probability that this patient has glaucoma. These tools have been traditionally available in most of the fundus cameras, but I don't think I have used any of them. I use it on my OCT because i can i can get these uh, values which they say is now the current definition of the cd of the of the cup to disc ratio you know things like that the concept itself has changed so we're looking at the bmo we're looking at all those things so those are very sophisticated uh, instruments and we are not sure that uh, we are going to do that uh, as the technology is increasing it will give you the basic details Take a photo while indenting. Yes, you can take a photo while indenting because you're recording it constantly. So the image extraction, so the image extraction needs a certain quality of image. So the moment it occupies the center, the, 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 the full part of your condensing lens, 
then it captures the image so you can see the intent and you can see that so again i said it's a question of how quickly you are using it and and it is an automatic because this recording is going on automatically so in fact i've been telling sam that give me a manual method also so that you know i can be pressing it but by the time you you can press it with your foot the patient may have moved so the best would be to probably take a recording yeah it's a little heavy uh, uh, recording which you get but the point is that you don't miss any image what you're seeing so yes you can do that excellent stuff so i think that seems to be all of the questions that we have for now um if anyone has any more questions please do feel free to type them now or follow up with us afterwards and we'll get back to you on those immediately and so with that um i suppose i can wrap things up so i'd just like to say thank you to dr rangaraj especially but all of you on the call as well as our other early adopters here on the screen um so we're working across the world and we're now ready to ship in india so this is an exciting opportunity um please let us know if you're interested and we can help kind of shape the future development with yourselves in the field uh we have also a try it before you buy it scheme in some regions so please reach out to your local representatives and we'll support you from there and so on that note uh thank you all very much and thank you, Dr. Rangaraj, again. Okay.